Welcome everybody, this is an introductory video to the SignalR playlist. Please find the link to it in the description if it's already complete. If you're watching this while I'm making it, subscribe for newer episodes that are going to be released. The information that I'm putting in this course is something that I already know or I will go and find out depending on what questions I want to answer. So I encourage you to ask questions in the comment sections of this video or any other video or on Discord. And if the question warrants a video, I will make it. Nevertheless, a Signal R tutorial. This playlist will cover Signal R for ASP.NET Core, not .NET Framework. Sure, they're quite similar, so I'm pretty sure you will be able to transfer your knowledge from one to the other. Let's proceed to the introduction. We're going to take a bird's eye view of Signal R, as well as talk about what we're going to cover in this playlist. So first of all, why do we need real-time communication? SignalR is a library for real-time communication and things exist to solve problems. The problem that SignalR solves is to retain customer attention for the brief period of time that customer is not giving the attention to your application. That's the time the customer spends to go and do something else. As soon as we, the human species, became the dominant species on planet Earth, we stopped hiding from lions, etc. We now have the time to ponder about many different things, existence, God, and whatnot. Don't let your customers do that. <laughs> Keep them on your website. Anyway, or let your customers do that, depending on whatever app you, you, you understand me. Better user experience, that's kind of just a byproduct. It's not a problem that we're trying to solve. And then Sometimes it's just a default requirement. If we're building video games or something like that, what kind of video game doesn't have real-time updates? Some of them don't, but you get the picture. How does it do it? How does SignalR do what it's do? How does real-time communication happens? So we have a client, this guy right here, or a girl, and this is a customer or a user. The customer is not the client. The client is what the customer is using to communicate with our service. It can be a phone, it can be a browser, or it can be a native application. Anyway, there is a communication that's happening between the client and the server, and this communication is called a duplex connection. A duplex connection is essentially data being sent both directions at the same time over the same connection. Pretty neat, right? So SignalR sometimes achieves this, sometimes it imitates this. So this will bring more questions. How does it really work? And we will explore this further in the episodes. But for now, let's just have a quick overview of things like WebSockets, which is basically the full duplex connection that we're talking about here. When we're using WebSockets, this is when we have full duplex connection and there is no illusions. Then we have server sent events, which is server to client connection. We tell the server, Yo, guy, send me messages when you got some for me. And then the server says, OK. And when the server has messages, it is going to send them to the client. However, the client cannot go and tell the server something else over that same connection. OK, so that's uh, the situation that we have with the server sent events. Then we have long polling. Long polling is just regular HTTP requests in a loop. So we're not going to be doing a deep dive on this. I believe there is nothing to deep dive on that. If you know how to use a fetch API, you can then use the set interval function in JavaScript and you have your long polling implemented. Well done. And then there is forever frame. Forever frame was implemented in .NET Framework SignalR. Since we're covering ASP.NET Core, we're not going to be covering this. I just wanted to basically mention it. If you have any questions about forever frame or ask me about forever frame, I'm going to go tell you what, go watch the introduction again, but it's essentially just an iframe in the background infinitely loading a web page, kind of like we have a buffering video. We're get grabbing parts of it and that is just partially grabbing a page. We know why we want SignalR. We don't want our users to lose attention or have a bad user experience. So this is why we need our server to be able to send messages to the client as quickly or as frequently as possible. What kind of applications would require that? Well, Chat messages could use long polling for messages, but long polling may be a little bit too slow if you want to show hints or if the person is online or the person is online, long polling would still be all right. So this, to display hints like somebody is typing, that will require a little bit faster communication. Then we have games. So updating positioning of players, other events like, I don't know, throwing your sword, casting a spell. These tend to be pretty competitive and would require very, very fast communication. So long polling definitely doesn't do here. We want WebSockets. So then we have collaboration tools. 
Excel, Word, Taskade, so to-do lists, and VS Code Live. So VS Code Live, I'm writing code, you can see the code I write, and we're working from the same ID, same thing as it's an Excel and Word or Google Spreadsheets. I'm making some changes, the other person can see the changes that I'm making. Hopefully you're not a stranger to this process of collaboration tools. And the final point I have here is navigation. So let's say you're trying to get from A to B, you're using Google Maps and uh, you know, you're, you, you have your travel plan and it's telling you when to turn. Let's say you have your long polling and uh, right before you are at a junction, it was gonna take five seconds for it to fetch uh, new information about what it needs to say but it's the green light and you already have to decide your turn right now. So for those kind of situations, again, you want the real time updates. You're at this junction 10 meters before, tell this person turn left or turn right. So again, as I said, sometimes it's about a good user experience, maybe like for things like chat and games, for other things like navigation and maybe again games, it's the default experience. If you don't have a real time update on when you need to turn, it's not a product that you can sell. So you're gonna learn this awesome tool. You're gonna get this shiny new screwdriver and you're gonna try to tighten some bolts, right? It's inevitable. You're gonna use a knife to unscrew things and open jars, you know, we're, we're just creative like that. So in order for you to not try to take a square and to try to peg it into a round hole, I'm just gonna tell you what, what things to avoid, right? When you learn a new design pattern or you learn design patterns, period, you'll try to fit them everywhere. Don't try to use SignalR for everything. You're gonna learn it and just don't try to replace everything with SignalR just because you see a similar pattern. Don't replace message queues. So distributing messages between background servers, you have server A, server B, one is producing events, the other one is consuming them. Do not replace that with SignalR. Do not replace regular HTTP communication with SignalR as well, okay? SignalR is not a replacement for HTTP messages. Do not put it in your pizza. I know some of you will try to do it. Do not do it. And then video streaming with SignalR. I think it's a popular thing to try and do first because you're thinking SignalR, real-time communication, streaming. I can do video streaming. I can do live streaming. You can, but there is basically a big, big problem to solve there and just better tools exist for video streaming. Don't put SignalR in that box. And then fully replace push notifications, okay? Some push notifications, you cannot just replace them with SignalR because if you wanna send something to iOS, you need to go through Apple. If you need to send something to Android, you need to go through Google. If you need to send something to the web browser, I think it's Google as well. So for all of these, they will basically require different services. The, the best situation where I say you can try to use SignalR is the user connects to your application. Any real time data or information that the user should be aware of while using your application, that's a perfect scenario to use SignalR, only while the user is using your application. If there is no user with a client, do not use SignalR. And that would be my advice in this situation. So all we cover in this video is we will take some deep dives. Obviously, I like deep dives. Anything that we do not understand, we're gonna try to get a little bit of a deeper understanding of that topic. We'll cover authentication, obviously my favorite topic. Everybody loves authentication. Everybody's gotta have an account link to do that. I mean, I said users and clients. If there is no authentication, there is no users, okay? We will go through some examples, okay? So the examples of uh, what can we build with it? Through some of these examples, I'll set up minimal reproductions and we'll basically go through them and uh, see how they work. And then hosting, if you're not, publishing to production, have you ever really built it? I mean, prototypes are fun, but seeing it work in production is a lot more fun. So we'll take a look at publishing our own SignalR service and maybe using, I think it's Azure hosted SignalR. We'll see how we can integrate with the various things. And yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, anything else that you want covered. So do leave a comment if you have any questions. Nevertheless, this is it for this introductory video. Hopefully you enjoy the playlist and don't forget to join my streams on Twitch.